Ayanuikawa was just your average teenage boy until he had a serial killer encounter with, well, a killer. But, lucky for Aikawa, though lucky might be up to debate a bit, he was resurrected as a zombie by a mute necromancer girl who now crashes at his place. Let's just say, his life isn't exactly resting in pieces, considering he's constantly escaping death in one form or another. Yeah, so supposedly after Aikawa became a zombie, he has died probably in the most embarrassing ways possible. If you ever seen dumb ways to die, well, that's pretty much his daily life. So, if you've ever daydreamed about immortality, you'll probably change your mind after seeing Aikawa's world. However, I did forget to mention that he does plan to take revenge against his killer if he manages to track him down. However, at least at this rate, he has already been killed too many times in humiliating ways to even keep track. A world full of monsters and vampires, there lived a guy named Ayumu Ekawa and his companion, Euclidewood. Ekawa, strolling to school on a beautiful day, found himself lost in deep thoughts about the mysteries of the universe. On his way back to school, he had a fateful encounter with a cat in front of Truck Kun, looking for his next victim and heroically leaped into action to help the cat. Well, I guess you could say he saved the cat, after being squashed like a potato, taking off the teacher's horrendous wig, showing his you-know-what to his classmates and even having the cat screaming for his own life. Once back home, Aikawa announced his return to Euclidewood, communicating by scribbling on a notebook since her vocal cords were on vacation. Euclidewood commanded Aikawa to conjure up dinner, but Aikawa's mind was wandering into some questionable territory, filled with perverted daydreams while attempting to prepare their meal. Despite Euclidewood's desire to assist, her inability to physically do so made the situation seem as if your useless self was helping out. As they enjoyed dinner and engaging in conversation, Aikawa inquired about Euclidewood's day, only to discover that it mostly consisted of napping and eating. So basically she's just like yourself. In the midst of their chat, Euclidewood broke his arm in attempting to touch her, basically saying shut up and eat. They delved into the story of how Euclidewood had resurrected Aikawa as a zombie after he fell victim to a dastardly culprit. As it turned out, Euclidewood is a necromancer hailing from the underworld, and she had miraculously brought Aikawa back to the realm of the living dead. Aikawa had been cohabitating with her for a solid month. That night, Aikawa received a phone call from his friend, who warned him about a serial killer lurking in their neighborhood. News reports confirmed that the killer had already claimed a victim. Determined to take revenge, thinking it could be the person who murdered him, Aikawa decided to embark on a city-wide search for the culprit. Aikawa decided to head towards the graveyard, where he finds it most peaceful. As he sat there, enjoying a refreshing beverage, a sudden commotion erupted, accompanied by billowing smoke. A cosplayer girl named Haruna emerged from the chaos, wielding a chainsaw that nearly murdered Aikawa. Aikawa, thinking she's the serial killer, yells at her, however out of nowhere, a colossal bear monster appeared and attacked him. And well, Haruna couldn't really care less, is it because he's a zombie? Well no, she doesn't know that yet, it's because she loses magical girl points if someone dies, thinking Aikawa is already done for. I just cannot make this up. She literally tells him to shut up go to the light and die and just casually slices Aikawa and the bear in half. Haruna, happy that her job is finished, like she ain't just cut a whole person in half, is surprised when she hears Aikawa speaking revealing that he's a zombie. Haruna introduces herself, saying that she's a genius magical girl. But Aikawa calls her an idiot, considering if he was human, she would have killed him, but you know no biggie. As Haruna tries to erase his memories, Aikawa accidentally takes her magical powers, making her powerless. Together, they made their way back home, where they shared a meal with Euclidewood. Haruna, still angry over losing her magical powers, vented her frustrations at Aikawa. Meanwhile, Aikawa discovered his own latent abilities, and Haruna decided to stick around until her magical predicament was resolved. Haruna, borrowing his phone, makes a call to her boss, who lives in a different dimension and explains her situation. Meanwhile, the only thing Aikawa is worried about is, how much will that phone call cost? Under the cloak of night, a mysterious man began tailing Haruna, tracing her every step back to Aikawa's humble abode. The following morning, Aikawa pondered his next move while contemplating the complexities of living with two eccentric girls. Just as he was deep in thought, his friend arrived and proposed a friendly game session at Aikawa's place. Aikawa promptly declined, considering the potential complications of such a situation. Suddenly, a man approached Aikawa, coming closer as if he was our creepy uncle when we were younger. However, Haruna materialized at the classroom window, brandishing her woodcutter, and the menacing student transformed into a gargantuan crayfish monster. What the are we even looking at? Anyways, Haruna attempted to unleash her super masu form but due to Aikawa accidentally taking her magic, it failed miserably, leaving her disrobed and terrified. The crayfish monster lunged at her, but Aikawa bravely stepped in with mighty punches, inadvertently breaking his own arm along the way. 
In a stroke of genius, Haruna suggested utilizing Mistletane, and Ikawa began chanting alongside her. The result was nothing short of astounding. Ikawa transformed into a well, a magical girl. The monster, in a desperate attempt to save face, hurled insults at Ikawa, labeling him a pervert. Unfazed, Ikawa unleashed a spectacular attack, ultimately defeating the crayfish menace. To make matters even worse, the other students who witnessed the showdown mistook Ikawa for a deranged pervert and snapped pictures of him. Haruna reassured Ikawa that he should take pride in his newfound role as a magical girl, but Ikawa couldn't help shedding tears as a zombie who said life as an undead hero would be easy, right? Ikawa, reflecting on his past, remembers how he stumbled upon Euclidewood in quite a peculiar way. You see, Ikawa had an unfortunate encounter with a murderer, resulting in his death. But, Euclidewood swooped in and brought him back to life. The next morning, Ikawa found himself having a normal day at school, mostly because he used his Masu Shoujo magic to erase the students' memories, and hopes he never has to do that again. During lunchtime, Ikawa discovered a delightful surprise in his lunchbox, courtesy of Haruna, a batch of fried eggs, with a side of eggs, and of course for dessert, fried eggs. Ikawa adjusted to the egg-filled reality and found them surprisingly tasty. To his delight, his friends also relished the eggs, proclaiming them to be downright delicious. Returning home, Ikawa expressed his gratitude to Haruna, asking her to put something else in it other than eggs. Of course though, that wasn't going to happen anytime soon. And so, they sat down for dinner, savoring the mouth-watering meat truffles that Ikawa had whipped up. Little did they know, the delectable feast was also aiding Haruna in her quest to restore her magical abilities. Euclidewood, with her quiet demeanor, complimented Ikawa on his skillful rice preparation. Well, at least in his imagination she did. But just as dinner was in full swing, an unexpected visitor crashed the party. A girl named Seraphim boldly joined the table, indulging in the meal without even offering a proper introduction. Turns out, she is a vampire ninja with a knack for being mysterious. She states that she needs Euclidewood to come to the ninja village with her. However, Ikawa attempts to whisk her away by telling her that he's her guardian but is quickly corrected by being called her servant. Seraphim, thinking that he isn't worthy enough to even be her servant challenges him to a fight. To settle their differences, the trio ventured to the graveyard, so much for the dead to rest in peace when someone is having a fight 24-7. Seraphim, determined to eliminate Euclidewood, unleashed a barrage of attacks, catching Ikawa off guard with a surprise strike that left him nursing an injury. Ikawa valiantly defended himself, although he did lose a hand in the process. But never fear, our quick-witted hero flung his severed hand as a weapon, proving that he's got some serious aim. Surprised by Ikawa's resourcefulness, Seraphim admitted defeat and decided to take her leave. However, by leave, she meant just leaving the battlefield and going back to his house and declaring that she will be Ikawa's servant instead. Ikawa can't help but wander into some amusing thoughts about what having Seraphim as his servant could entail, suggesting that she addresses him as Oni-chan. But, Seraphim shut down his proposal, referring to him as a damn insect that doesn't even deserve to be on the same planet as her. As night fell, Euclidewood serenely enjoyed a cup of tea in the backyard, while Ikawa lounged on her bed contemplating life, or, well, undead life. Suddenly, Seraphim him appeared, descending from the ceiling like a true ninja, and struck up a conversation about Euclidewood's guarded heart and introverted nature. Ikawa recognized these traits as Euclidewood's true personality, and Seraphim, trusting her girly heart, believes something happened that makes her like this. Lost in thought, Ikawa reminisced about the time he first met Euclidewood while sitting in front of a market one night. He attempted to charm her with a pickup line involving UFOs, which, let's just say, didn't quite hit the mark. To salvage the situation, Ikawa broke into an impromptu dance, resulting in a rather painful hand injury. Surprisingly, Euclidewood found the dance intriguing but advised Ikawa to never attempt it again, because it looked weird. From that moment on, they engaged in a heartfelt conversation, with Euclidewood responding through her trusty notebook. As Ikawa made his way home, he heard a girl screaming and decided to rush in to help her, only to end up with a sword piercing his stomach, bringing him face to face with death. However, Ikawa woke up to find Euclidewood by his side, revealing the truth about his untimely demise and subsequent resurrection as a zombie. The breakfast table became a meeting ground for our quirky crew, with Seraphim casually mentioning that the vampire ninja villages had been locked in a century-long war. Ikawa, sharing some of his personal struggles, but basically hating his guts, didn't want any sympathy from a disgusting worthless zombie. Naturally, a heated argument erupted between Ikawa and Haruna over the contents of his lunchbox for school. Haruna, in her frustration, liberally throwing around the word die, which resulted in a swift slap from Euclidewood, writing that death shouldn't be taken lightly. Haruna, in an attempt to apologize, gives her leftovers to her and retreats to her bed, taking note of the gloomy rainy weather outside. 
The next morning brings Haruna, jolting awake from a dream involving a treacherous pudding slicing incident, only to get herself beat up by her own alarm. Meanwhile, Ikawa rises to face reality yet again of a zombie. They both gather around for a delightful breakfast, savoring their beloved fried eggs. Ikawa proudly displays the gifts he received from his well-meaning parents, including a set of mismatched socks and a world's best zombie coffee mug. After breakfast, Ikawa ventures off to school, armed with an umbrella as his trusty sun-shielding companion. His friend Orito, in his endless pursuit of impressing the ladies, shamelessly attempts to convince them to join him for a bowling outing, only to be met with repulsed glares and gross comments like yourself. In a desperate attempt to save his sanity, he says that he's too good-looking for the girls and Orito boldly invites Aikawa along for the ride as the girls back home indulge in a game for the last cup of pudding. As the games continue they decide to order sushi for lunch, with of course using Aikawa's wallet. Meanwhile, Aikawa accompanies Orito on a trip to purchase a mask, where Orito makes fun of him, calling him a kid for purchasing a mask, and no girl would ever buy a mask like that, as if it isn't already a bunch of girls with masks behind him. This is exactly why his ugly self got rejected by every girl in the school. And to make the matters worse, Orito begins claiming that he needs a real woman, and girls in uniform aren't enough for him. Heikawa being the best friend he can be, slowly dies silently, begging God to help him. As fate would have it, Ikawa suddenly spots a surprising sight, Euclidewood, Haruna, and Seraphim among the bowlers. Orito's mind, forever entrenched in perverted thoughts, envisions the girls frolicking in bikinis, much to Ikawa's chagrin. Worried about being spotted, Ikawa hastily concocts an excuse to escape to the washroom. Although he didn't really get far, since Orito pointed out that he had already gone to the restroom, hiding his face away, hoping to God nobody notices him. But it was already too late considering Haruna was calling his name the entire time. Orito, being the idiot he is, begins thinking that Haruna is talking to him, and it's his time to shine. Only to be quickly dumbfounded after she made it clear. Ekawa, with his mask on, claims to be masked Ekawa attempting to hide his identity. Seraphim calls him a disgusting pervert, but still finds him less creepy with the mask on. Orito ponders how does he knows these girls, only to find out that they stay in his house. And well, let's just say Ekawa wasn't the one that died this time. Mentally, physically, and well any other way you're probably thinking. Ekawa affirms him if that one in a million chance he did get lucky in the way he is thinking, they would turn him into a literal sandbag. To settle his crisis he decides to challenge Ekawa to a bowling match, if he wins he gets to stay in Ekawa's home, and while he is a zombie, the results were kinda expected. On their journey homeward, Orito extends an unexpected invitation to Ekawa, a visit to the hospital, where a girl who survived the serial killer attack is recovering. Ekawa, curious as ever, asks the girl if she managed to see the culprit. She describes him as having beautiful eyes, a youthful appearance, and wearing gauntlets. This description immediately brings Euclidewood to Ekawa's mind, leaving him in a state of confusion. Meanwhile, back at home, Euclidewood is casually enjoying the last cup of pudding, blissfully unaware of the chaos unfolding around her. The other girls, determined to get their hands on that last cup, are still fighting amongst themselves, completely unaware that Euclidewood is already savoring its delicious contents. At the night, while Haruna and Seraphim are having a blast in the kitchen preparing dinner, it turns out Seraphim decided to try cooking for the first time. Let's just say her dish wasn't a masterpiece, it was more like a volcanic eruption that turned the soup into molten lava. Despite the culinary catastrophe, she had poor Ikawa be the taste tester, which was somehow enough to make a zombie see the light of God. When Ikawa finally regains consciousness, he takes charge and orders pizza for everyone, because, let's face it, after that soup, they deserve it. Meanwhile, amidst the chaos in the kitchen, Haruna makes a call to her teacher, telling her that the mission is going great, even though she knows dang well she hasn't done anything. Suddenly, the peaceful moments are shattered by the ringing of the doorbell, and a visitor named Kerberos Wansard, who introduces himself as the guardian of the underworld. It turns out Ikawa has already been to the underworld, but since he was revived, he managed to escape, and Kerberos is here to whisk him back. But before anyone can comprehend what's happening, Kerberos launches into an attack on Ikawa, leaving everyone stunned. Euclidewood steps in to save the day, revealing her incredible healing powers. Kerberos, realizing that Euclidewood, also known as Master Hellscythe, must have meant that she revived him herself, but she just forgot to write off Ikawa's death as a mistake to the other world. Realizing his mistake, Kerberos decides to depart and offers to help take the souls being currently murdered at this moment. Determined to get to the bottom of the mystery, Aikawa decides to join forces with Kerberos. As they delve deeper into the investigation, they uncover a chilling truth. Souls aren't making it to the underworld anymore, instead, they're being sacrificed to a mysterious figure known as the King of the Night. 
However, before they could realize, the figure suddenly stabs them both, with Kerberos jumping in front of Aikawa in an attempt to save his life. In the aftermath of a brutal encounter, Aikawa comes home, explaining the recent events to Euclidwood. Aikawa tells Euclidwood that Kerberos died protecting him, even though Aikawa is a zombie. Aikawa apologizes to Euclidwood because that must have hurt back then. She tells him that it's fine since she is used to it. He asks if the reason that made her suppress her emotions, replying that when affected by strong magic powers, the wavering becomes larger and fiercer. She thinks of herself as unstable and insecure. The movement of her heart disrupts her magic power, and if that interferes with the thread of fate, it will change reality. That is why she must not allow herself to show her emotions. Suddenly, Aikawa remembers how Euclidwood has stopped him from doing something interesting which may force her to show some emotions. She hands over another note which explains that the reason why she doesn't speak is that her words would be filled with magic. That is why she has restrained herself from speaking. Her words are a burden. She doesn't even know when or what words will be transformed into power. That is why she must not allow herself to utter a single word. She can't speak even little words because if she does, she feels extreme pain in her head, and she doesn't want it to happen anymore. Magic flows in her veins, and her heart holds an enormous amount of magic power. Aikawa asks her about her armor, and Euclidwood replies that the gauntlets and plate armor were for sealing her magic, and her powers had nothing to do with her will. Even if she dies, her magic power will still be activated. Euclidwood asks Aikawa while crying silently if he hates her now because if her emotions were triggered, Aikawa's fate would be the one most affected. Euclidwood continues that if knew he had a monster by his side, he would hate her. Aikawa yells at her that he doesn't see any monster but a kind girl sitting in front of him. Euclidwood asks if it's alright for her to stay with him. Taking the notepad, he writes that he wants her to stay with him, no matter what price he has to pay. This reveals the depth of Euclidwood's struggle with her own emotions and powers, leaving Aikawa determined to find a way to help her. But as fate would have it, their peaceful moment is shattered by the appearance of a monstrous threat, a triple A-class megalo hovering ominously above the city. Aikawa leaps into action, transforming into a magical girl once again with Seraphim by his side. Of course, Seraphim can't resist calling him an ugly pervert in the heat of battle. In a battle of epic proportions, they face off against the gargantuan monster, with Haruna and Seraphim pulling out all the stops to protect the city. With teamwork and sheer determination, Aikawa and his allies emerge victorious, defeating the monstrous threat and saving the day once again. And as the dust settles, they can't help but wonder what other adventures await them in this crazy, supernatural world they call home. After a fun-filled day together, Haruna and Seraphim share a cozy moment, but their bonding takes an unexpected turn when Seraphim reveals her vampire side by indulging in a little bloodsucking from Haruna. Haruna tries to reclaim her lost magic powers but ends up in a rather compromising situation, naked and vulnerable. Just when things couldn't get any more awkward, Aikawa barges in and gets an Eiffel, earning himself a swift scolding and eviction from the room for being an erotic bastard. Later, as the girls relax in the bath, Aikawa takes on the less glamorous task of dishwashing. His piece is interrupted by a call from Dai, Haruna's teacher, who mistakenly informs Aikawa about Haruna's misguided quest for an artifact called Kyotafu. Aikawa promises to handle it and tries to relay the message to Haruna who's too preoccupied with ice cream to pay attention. Just as Aikawa's trying to wrap his head around one call, another comes in, this time from Kayoyuko, who's just been discharged from the hospital. They arrange to meet up, and Aikawa finds himself face to face with Kayoyuko at a quaint telephone booth. The next day, Aikawa bides his time in school until the sun sets, then heads to the graveyard after dinner with Euclidwood. Despite her suggestion to stay, Aikawa leaves to meet Kayoyuko who isn't who she's claimed to be and has the ability to manipulate memories. Transforming into her true form as a magical girl, she launches a vicious attack on Aikawa, freezing him in place with her magical barrier. Just when all hope seems lost, the cavalry arrives in the form of Haruna and Seraphim, ready to throw down. Despite initial confusion from Haruna, they quickly get into battle mode, with Seraphim tapping into a newfound power, the Swallow Technique. But Kayoyuko proves to be a formidable foe, revealing her dark secret of killing to achieve eternal life. In a dramatic showdown, Aikawa transforms into a magical girl, albeit with a comically perverted twist, and the battle intensifies. Despite Kayoyuko's relentless assault, Aikawa manages to turn the tables with his ultimate powers and, well, unconventional tactics. But just when victory seems within grasp, Kayoyuko springs back to life, ready for round two. As the treacherous chick Kayoyuto launched her attack on Aikawa and his comrades, who clearly weren't fans of the despicable Ayuma, her efforts were swiftly nullified when the silent demoness arrived on the battlefield. Kayoyuto couldn't help but praise Euclidwood's aura, admitting she could sense Euclidwood's magical power even from a distance. Amidst laughter, Kayoyuto continued her assault on Euclidwood, 
but the necromancer effortlessly deflected her attacks without so much as a flinch. Finally, Euclid had had enough. She reached for the pink chainsaw lying on the ground and transformed into the ultimate magical girl herself. It was at this moment that Ayuma, the dim-witted protagonist, had a sudden flashback to when Haruna lost both her powers and her clothes. He realized that the same force that stripped Haruna of her abilities and attracted the Megalos was none other than Euclidewood, the core of everything, the world's greatest and most powerful spiral of magic. Taking a step forward, Euclidewood confronted Kaiyudo, who scoffed at Euclidewood's decision to meddle in such affairs, accusing her of obsessing over a single boring man in a boring town. But Kaiyudo's insults fell on deaf ears as Euclidewood, warning Ayuma and the others not to interfere, prepared to face her adversary. With a graceful move, Euclidewood positioned herself at a distance from Kaiyudo, ready to engage. Kaiyudo unleashed her full potential, amplifying her attacks 500 times over, only to find herself facing the formidable necromancer, whose powers were unmatched. With each exertion, Kaiyudo's arms suffered, her skin ripping from the strain, leaving her exhausted and coughing blood. Euclidewood, with a calm demeanor, simply told her to move her weak, useless ass along. But Kaiyudo pressed on, her attacks relentless. However, her resilience was no match for Euclidewood's power. With a single word, die, Euclidewood brought Kaiyudo to her knees, turning the tree behind her to dust in the process. Despite Euclidewood's repeated attempts to end the battle, Kaiyudo refused to yield, her laughter echoing in defiance. Eventually, Kaiyudo, driven to desperation, launched a suicide attack on Euclidewood, leaving her momentarily incapacitated as she shifted her focus to Ayuma, the bumbling fool she wished to punish. However, Haruna, seizing the opportunity, grabbed the chainsaw and unleashed her fury upon Kaiyudo, with Seraphim and the zombified Ikawa joining the fray. Yet, despite their efforts, Kaiyudo proved resilient, her body healing even as they inflicted damage upon her. Ayuma, seizing the chainsaw from Haruna, transformed into a magical girl himself, determined to understand Euclidewood's struggles. With each strike, he felt the weight of Kaiyudo's malice, but he refused to relent. Finally, with Kaiyudo on her last life, Ayuma, the useless wimp, spared her useless self, rendering her unconscious. As they regrouped, another figure appeared, Dai Sensei who warned Ikawa of the consequences had Kaiyudo perished. But before they could fully comprehend the situation, Kaiyudo, under the control of a dark spirit, vanished, leaving them to ponder the mysteries of their world. Returning home, Ikawa found himself contemplating the bizarre events while enjoying rice cakes with Euclidewood, Seraphim, and Haruna, whose bickering over cooking provided a humorous backdrop. Reflecting on their journey, Ikawa questioned Euclidewood about her past creations of zombies, to which she replied with a hint of uncertainty, recalling a former zombie consumed by malice. As they settled into their peculiar existence, Ikawa couldn't help but wonder if Euclidewood truly enjoyed their current lifestyle. Her response, a simple, I don't dislike it. And with that, the eccentric adventures of Ikawa and his companions continued. Haruna found herself in a futile endeavor attempting to explain the intricacies of spiral galaxies to the dense airhead Ikawa, while Sira and Euclidewood found entertainment in melodramas on TV. Ikawa, originally intending to study math, regretted initiating the conversation that led to Haruna's cosmic lecture. But Euclidewood, ever the genius, effortlessly solved all the math problems in Ikawa's notebook with a single stroke of her pen, leaving Haruna to interpret the equations in her own unique animal language. The next day, as Ikawa faced his exam, he felt confident, having been tutored by the genius magical girl. However, his focus was disrupted when he spotted Haruna suctioned to the window, informing him of a Megalo's appearance. Despite the distraction, Ikawa remained determined to excel in his exam, unwilling to add another failure to his record. After the exams, Ikawa sought out Haruna and the Megalo, skulking in the shadows to maintain an air of mystery. But his plans were interrupted by a call from Dai Sensei, who entrusted him with a task to hide something from Haruna. As the Megalo threatened Haruna, Ikawa intervened, transforming into a magical girl and wielding his chainsaw. However, Ikawa's heroics were short-lived as he was overwhelmed by a group of jellyfish megalos. The boss jellyfish, mistaking Ikawa for a cute magical girl, attempted to take advantage but recoiled in disgust upon discovering Ikawa's true nature. As the battle ensued, a mysterious figure named Maelstrom appeared, wielding some motherfricking ramen noodles as a fricking weapon. Sira and Ikawa found themselves in Maelstrom's base, where Ikawa received a lecture on the art of defeating megalos with motherfricking useless ramen. Meanwhile, Sira took the opportunity for some alone time with Ikawa, revealing Maelstrom's polite demeanor towards him due to an accidental kiss, which in vampire ninja culture symbolized marriage. 
Back at home, as preparations for Christmas were underway, Aikawa stumbled upon a room where Sira, Haruna, and Euclidwood were cosplaying in eclectic outfits. The following day, a mysterious girl delivered a parcel from Dai Sensei, which turned out to be an erotic glass. Maelstrom appeared once more, offering Aikawa something to eat and inadvertently revealing her reluctant status as Aikawa's husband in vampire ninja tradition. Just when Aikawa thought things couldn't get any stranger, Orita appeared, recognizing Maelstrom as Yashida Tamanori from a neighboring class. Amidst the chaos, Aikawa found himself in another absurd situation, reconsidering if being being alive is even worth it. The day began with Aikawa, the careless and disgusting individual he was, nearly losing the erotic glasses due to his negligence. When the glasses finally made it to Sira, she wasted no time in putting them on, much to Aikawa's dismay. He was promptly dubbed a crude and obscene insect, a title that brought him to tears of shame. Meanwhile, Haruna woke from an erotic dream involving Aikawa, which sent her rushing to his room in a frenzy, only to find him peacefully asleep. In a fit of rage, she pounced on him, unleashing a barrage of kicks and curses for his perceived perverted antics. Honestly, it was a moment that perfectly encapsulated the frustration of the entire female population. At school, Aikawa found himself faced with Arita's request to share his lunch, while Mail sought the help of a girl from Aikawa's class, Kanami, whom she confessed to having fallen in love with useless Aikawa. Kanami, perplexed by Mail's sudden interest in Aikawa, urged her to embrace her femininity in an attempt to win his heart. The next day, Yashida prepared lunch for Aikawa in a bid to impress him, while Sira received a mysterious message. Mail, pondering her next move to win Aikawa's affections, seized the opportunity to walk with him halfway home, despite Aikawa's protests about her insistence on being his wife. As they walked, Aikawa tried to explain to Mail that they couldn't be married, but her determination remained unwavering. Their encounter caught the attention of Haruna, who appeared wearing casual housewife attire, clearly displeased to see Aikawa with Mail. Despite Haruna's frustration, Aikawa invited her, along with Sira and Euclidwood, to accompany them to the mall. As they shopped, Mail fantasized about Aikawa, while Aikawa found himself drawn to Sira's antics, only to have his useless disgusting eyeballs popped. After a meal at a restaurant, Haruna confronted Aikawa about kissing Mail, leaving Aikawa scrambling for an explanation. Their conversation was interrupted when Mail whisked Aikawa away to play games, resulting in an injury inflicted by Sira and Haruna's disdain for vampire ninja traditions. As Aikawa bought drinks, Haruna appeared out of nowhere, expressing her desire to kiss him, but since you know, this man's got 0% chance of getting any action, she assaulting him and storms off. Upon their return, they discovered that Euclidwood had disappeared, leaving them to wonder about the next bazaar. Sira's mind was racing with suspicions, had someone surpassed her skills and snatched Euclidwood away without a trace. Meanwhile, she had skewered another mysterious figure tailing them since the shopping mall escapade. Finally, Sira spilled the beans she'd been handed an order to off Euclidwood. Aikawa's brain struggled to compute this revelation. What in the world are you blabbering about? He blurted out. Wasn't Sira supposed to be the one to whisk Euclidwood back to the ninja village? Euclidwood, her weapon drawn, turned to the mysterious stalker. Do you blame me? She demanded. His response was laden with disappointment. He had believed in her. He wanted Euclidwood to come home with him, but she dismissed it as impossible. The tension thickened as he hinted at a past betrayal, and Euclidwood cut to the chase, demanding to know his intentions now. With a heavy heart, he confessed to being puzzled by her current company of idiotic friends. Sira then revealed the organization's nefarious plan to assassinate Euclidwood, linking it to her magical prowess and the recent string of megalo attacks. Sira stressed she didn't want to harm Euclidwood but felt bound by the organization's orders. As Sira and Aikawa bickered, Haruna and Mail looked on, fretting. Aikawa, fed up with ninja codes, simply asked Sira if she truly intended to kill Euclidwood. Sira, emotionally wrought, vehemently denied it. Haruna intervened, urging them to focus on finding Euclidwood first, the killing could wait. In a surprising turn, Sira thanked Aikawa, acknowledging his role in swaying her from her mission. The tension peaked when a ferris wheel threatened Aikawa, but miraculously, he emerged unscathed. However, the looming threat remained. Euclidwood's instability manifested as a colossal megalo descended upon Haruna. Despite their efforts, they couldn't free her, and Euclidwood pleaded with the mysterious man to spare Haruna. As Dai Sensei joined the fray, the situation escalated. Mail, under the influence of Dark Mist, unleashed chaos. Despite Dai Sensei's efforts, Mail couldn't be stopped, and they could only wait for her to power down or risk self destruction. Aikawa, despite his shock, bravely approached Mail and ultimately saved her from the malfunctioning golem. As the chaos subsided, Mail, tearfully grateful, delivered a well-deserved punch to Aikawa. The mysterious man vanished in a puff of black mist after zapping Aikawa with a shocking parting gift. 
Euclid, realizing the danger she posed, left for their safety. Ikawa, overwhelmed by emotion, read Euclid's diary, shedding tears of regret. But Haruna, ever the motivator, wouldn't let him wallow in despair, reminding him that the Nato was still sticking, never give up. And thus, they returned home, Ikawa carrying the weight of Euclidwood's absence, but with a newfound determination fueled by friendship and fermented soybeans. It had been a few months since Euclidwood bid them farewell, and despite their relentless search, they were unable to locate her. Ikawa's alter ego was ready to throw in the towel, but Ikawa remained steadfast in his belief that there had to be a way. Meanwhile, Haruna was trying to navigate the intricacies of doing Ikawa's laundry, a task made all the more challenging by her frustration with his general uselessness. Their mundane routine was interrupted when they heard a commotion outside their room. Rushing out, they found Sira lying on the floor, barely conscious and injured. As Sira recounted being attacked by another vampire ninja from her clan for abandoning her mission to kill Euclidwood, the doorbell rang. Aruna, hopeful for a delivery of food, was disappointed when it turned out to be a useless violin instead. Sira, ever the critic, scoffed at Aikawa's ignorance of violins before grudgingly playing a tune for Haruna's sake. While Aikawa was out eating, he overheard a conversation about animals and their feelings, only to realize that one of the speakers was the same man who had been with Euclidwood before her disappearance, another zombie. Alerting Sira and Haruna, Aikawa cautioned against attacking him, claiming the man as his prey. However, their confrontation turned violent as the man attacked Ikawa with black mist, injuring him. Sira retaliated, but the man immobilized her, intending to use her as bait to lure Euclidwood. Just as the situation seemed dire, Mail and her friend Sarah's arrived to save the day. With their assistance, they managed to thwart the man's plans and send him fleeing. However, in the chaos, Haruna inadvertently glued Ikawa's legs together with wood adhesive. As they retreated home, Sira resolved to search for Euclidwood on her own, leaving Ikawa and Haruna to deal with their sticky situation. The next day, Mail informed Ikawa of the king's location, a secret she hadn't shared with anyone else. Ikawa relayed this information to Haruna, and they set out to confront the king. Meanwhile, Sira encountered Euclidwood outside their door, only to be stabbed by the king as Euclidwood watched passively. After Euclidwood healed Sira with her blood, Sira informed Ikawa and Haruna about Euclidwood's presence. Racing to the location provided by Mail, they found Euclidwood sitting on the ground, seemingly indifferent to the chaos around her. The king invited Haruna to join them for lunch, and as they conversed about immortality, Sarah's unexpectedly appeared. As the king seized Euclidwood and fled, Haruna found herself engulfed in black mist, with a time bomb ticking away on her head. In a desperate attempt to save Haruna, Aikawa grabbed the bomb and leaped out of the window, sacrificing his useless self to protect his friends. As he pondered Euclidwood's inexplicable reaction earlier, the bomb detonated in mid-air, leaving Aikawa grappling with the aftermath of his decision. Mail, Haruna, and Sirius have collected the blown away parts of Aikawa and gathered them to reincarnate him. As the body gathers itself, Aikawa is still asleep. Haruna tries to kiss Aikawa, but Mail stops her, reminding her that she's Aikawa's lip-sworn wife. With no choice, Sirius steps in and tries to administer medicine to Aikawa, but to her surprise, she shoves secret poison instead of medicine into his mouth. Meanwhile, the king is with Euclidwood, discussing his death. Haruna is worried about Aikawa, who hasn't woken up yet. Aikawa wakes up in his consciousness, where Haruna and Sirius are mocking him for his weakness, claiming it's the reason why Euclidwood rejected him. Haruna starts drowning as they both move away. Desperate, Haruna calls Dai-sensei and begs her to visit. Blaming herself for Aikawa's condition, Dai-sensei casts a spell and sends her delusional ass to sleep. Aikawa is still in some place, on the brink of disappearing, when Haruna jumps in to save him from his hateful thoughts. Haruna punches Aikawa hard to bring him back to his senses, but Aikawa, being an idiot, won't understand without a good beating. Finally, Haruna gets emotional and pleads with him to return. Then, Haruna disappears, and Aikawa wakes up. Saraswati arrives to give Sirius her attachments. Sirius enters the room to inform Haruna about a megalo, which Aikawa has already sensed. Aikawa and Haruna head to the tower to find the king and Euclidwood waiting for them. Euclidwood asks Haruna via a paper plane note why it was peaceful in Aikawa's life without her. Aikawa interjects, stating it wasn't right without Euclidwood. Moving towards Euclidwood, Aikawa takes the paper she was making an airplane from, revealing that Euclidwood always caused problems for him. King joins the conversation, informing Aikawa that a Magilo has been called forth by Euclidwood. King always wanted to see Euclidwood's sorrowful face. Haruna, disgusted with King's fetish, calls him a perverted freak. 
King warns them that the city will be destroyed due to Aikawa's resistance. He tells Yuklewa to kill him quickly, but she refuses. Aikawa calls King Pitiful, as he understands nothing about Euclid. Sirius stands atop the tower, ready to play the violin because either Euclid's blood or the melody of vampires can save the city. As she starts playing, the ghosts vanishing from the huge sphinx face in the sky. King tells Aikawa that death is painful but better than living. He attacks Aikawa, who fights back, but won't lay a finger on King. The pink chainsaw starts shaking on its own as Aikawa heals. King cautions Euclid to witness the unintended repercussions of her altruistic actions. Sensing the fervor of the pink chainsaw, Haruna implores Aikawa to embrace his transformation. As the eager blade thirsts for blood, Aikawa and Haruna undergo their transformation as Ceres diligently continues her spirit exorcism. Ceres is taken aback as colossal megalos manifest before her. Saraswati and fellow ninjas unite with Ceres, forming a formidable alliance to banish the looming threat of the megalos. Sirius's enchanting melody serves as a barrier against the aerial sphinx, while Aikawa and Haruna launch a relentless assault on King with their chainsaw, triggering a cataclysmic explosion. Haruna is forcefully expelled from the tower, while Aikawa reverts to his mundane attire. Aikawa and King engage in a fierce clash against the backdrop of shattering glass. In a revelation, King discloses his long-standing acquaintance with Euclid predating Aikawa's acquaintance with her. Aikawa confides in King, admitting that despite their time together, he remains oblivious to Euclid's genuine smiles and the joy she radiates. In a passionate exchange about Euclid, Aikawa overwhelms King, expressing his emotions through action. Their confrontation halts abruptly when Euclid intervenes, showcasing her influence over Aikawa's behavior. After King regenerates, he implores Aikawa to understand the anguish of immortality and urges him not to hold resentment towards Euclid. However, Aikawa's response diverges from expectation, echoing the unconventional paths tread by Siras and Haruna. In a poignant moment, Euclid steps forward, grasps King's hand, and, in an act of closure, brings his existence to an end. Meanwhile, Siras triumphs over the Megalos, clearing the path for a new beginning. As Euclid fulfills King's final wish, she stands alone, embodying both strength and solitude. Aikawa yells at her to stay with him and never leave again. Euclid tells Aikawa he's being selfish, just like Haruna. Aikawa is taken aback when he hears Euclid speak for the first time. He finally hugs her. Euclid warns Aikawa that he will face many problems because of her, but Aikawa decides to take everything on at the cost of Euclid being with him. As they have a wholesome moment, Haruna falls from the sky wearing a Hawaiian dress, disrupting their special moment. Haruna explains she was on a trip around the world. She's also shocked to hear the cute voice of the necromancer. As they return home, Haruna tells Aikawa he's been invited to Yggdrasil. They start celebrating, thinking about swimming all day, but Siras ruins Aikawa's moment, telling him it would be disgusting to let an undead useless disgusting insect to see her skin. Aikawa and his party, along with Dai Sensei, rush towards Yggdrasil. It took Haruna 999 lottery tickets before finally winning. The public is shocked to see Siras's huge melons in a red bra. Haruna is also jealous of Siras since she only has little barriers. Suddenly, Euclid shows up in a full swimsuit, casually floating around on a balloon. Haruna starts looking at Euclid's time barriers and tells Aikawa not to be the person who worries about melon sizes. But ironically, Haruna is the one worried about the size. As they start enjoying the indoor beach, Euclid floats around while Konami takes her to play ball. Haruna joins them, and as they have fun, Siras keeps violating Aikawa, telling him he's reached a historical record for weakness to women, which is disgusting. Suddenly, Mail also joins Aikawa with her friends. Kanami takes Euclid to play ball, and Haruna also joins them. As they have fun, Siras enjoys her drink while roasting Aikawa, calling him a sexual predator. Siras finishes her drink and sees that Euclid looks like she's having fun. Seems like Haruna and Siras are more calamity to Aikawa than Euclid. Haruna throws a ball, hitting Aikawa straight in the face, and then asks him to hit it back properly. Suddenly, while Aikawa is casually walking and enjoying his drink, he sees an outrageous idol performing on stage. Aikawa also spots Orito in the audience, who tells him the idol is lovely Karara, dominating the internet. Aikawa realizes that Karara is none other than Sarasvati who became a star in the blink of an eye with her mischievous looks and sexy appeal. Orito starts worshipping her with words. Suddenly, Siras also appears behind Aikawa, asking if what she's seeing is reality or just a dream, because she can't believe she's seeing Sarasvati performing on stage. Siras confronts Sarasvati, who claims to be lovely Karara in the light and Sarasvati in the shadows. Sarasvati starts cursing the audience, which the weird idiotic audience seems to like. Orito thinks Siras is also debuting as an idol on stage. Siras tells Sarasvati that suddenly becoming an idol is inappropriate, 
but Sarah's body challenges her to stop her with force. Sarah's accepts the challenge and starts performing against Sarah's body. If Sarah's wants Sarah's body to listen to her demands, she must defeat her first. In a whirlwind of chaos and unexpected antics, the stage was set for a showdown between the unlikeliest of performers. Sarah's, determined to make a statement, shed her inhibitions along with her top, unveiling a side that even caught herself off guard. As jaws dropped, Sarasvati took the opportunity to ramp up her own appeal, utilizing every ounce of her seductive prowess to amass a legion of followers. But just as the stage seemed set for a showdown of sultry proportions, Haruna burst onto the scene, ready to make her mark as an idol. With Arito's dreams fulfilled and tears flowing freely, chaos erupted as Haruna's performance, albeit with a questionable song choice, skyrocketed her to stardom, much to everyone's bewilderment. So powerful was Haruna's showmanship that it caused Orito's poor computer to go up in smoke, only for Euclidewood to materialize with a desire to sing, hampered only by her own magic. Enter Dai Sensei, wielding a contraption of colossal proportions, proposing a magical exchange that would have Euclidewood's enchantments flowing through Ikawa for a limited time. As Haruna's grand finale left the audience reeling, the lights dimmed, and Euclidewood took center stage with a voice that could soothe even the wildest of crowds. But as Aikawa's head began to throb with inexplicable pain, little did he know that his unwitting participation was the key to restoring Euclidewood's magic. Haruna appears behind Euclidewood, taking her arm, and helps her continue her calm song. Siras and Sarasvati start performing behind them. Aikawa starts thinking it would be great if all women around the world wore flashy outfits like Sarah's or Sira's. Suddenly, Aikawa's head starts hurting again, and his words turn into reality. All girls around the world change into bikini models. Sira's finds out it was Aikawa's doing and shoves her ankle in his face, burying him in the ground. The next day, Aikawa decides never to go to the pool again with his party since they cause an uproar. Everyone returns to their normal lives. Aikawa returns home and finds Euclidewood, Haruna, and Sira's waiting for him. That concludes the recap for now, as always if you enjoyed. Let me know down below and make sure you are subscribed. I'm out.